Sanbonan Dumelang Abshen, great to have you back on yet another episode of our Thrill a Minute Conversations. This is the Viceroy Volume Lomo Conversations on Culture. I go back to episode one where we dealt specifically on culture, how it impacts us as a society. Episode two, we took it one step further where we started to deal and delve in the issues of tradition and how that affected your back pocket. So today, episode three, it gives me such a great pleasure and a thrill that we will be touching on identity. We look at the current generation. Do they have enough within themselves to pass it on to a younger generation, a newer generation? Who can claim Africa as a culture? So we're gonna be unpacking all of that. We'll take all of the social media conversations as well. We'll bring them onto the table. Ubaba Umbuso Koza is back conversational, interrogating, and I'm sure Usuti Sanda Gwele Wanongo. Jabulu Bonaba. Hm, Ubabo Muza Suti, Umatuan and Unom Zanz and Amsan, Obat is in the no more. Those are also tired. I'm suitable. But thank you so much for this opportunity. But we are here to make or invite our fellow Africans to come and think with us mm. around these uh, topics. Mm. What is identity? A base. Mm. Uh, it's what we have over the years acquired, taking it from accounts of histories, mm. and we ended up identifying with those things. I, I think that's a, that's a beautiful way to start and to break it down because identity is going to be the key word running around. Uh, Dr. Jessica, Dr. Bishop, Jessica Mbangi. I woke up like this, I'm a queen. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, beauty is uh, one of the things that identify who I am because it's part of our intelligence. Right. Yes, uh, and it's good to be back here at Fulumlomo. Uh, there is so much crucial things that, as the Africans, we have not been able to address because we've been moving away for, from who we are because of the boundaries. And it feels good as well that you're going to be here expressing your opinion, I guess, but also just maybe your identity. If anybody ever questioned anybody's identity around the table, they're going to unpack it. They've told me that they're ready for this ride as well. Um, you know, psychologists as well as spiritual healer, First time on the panel. Annalisa Saswana, good to see you. Welcome to the panel. And I think more than anything else, <laughs> what a topic and what a panel. Oh, Gabong, uh, for having me in this conversation on Volum Lomo. So, Volum Lomo, basically, you need to ask for permission. And when I left, I said, Okoko, the one on Pet, the one who's my spirit ancestor, lead me so that you are granted the space to embody these identities that she has gifted me with. I look at the world from an intersectional perspective. I'm a gay man who is black, who happens to be a healer and a psychologist. Sure. And I suppose I will kind of embody what that looks like in practice. Talking about clinical psychology, yeah, we've got one more member. One of the new members that are joining us, Mrs. Sinobile Adirinoye. I hope I pronounced that correctly. But welcome, welcome onto the panel. Great pleasure to have you. Hey, Carol. Good morning, San Bunan. So I think it's wonderful to be here today, especially discussing what we are discussing. Yes, being a psychologist, as Anneli has said, is still a thing. Yeah. Being gay is still a thing. And we are not simply South Africans. If you look across Ndubabkoza, is brilliant because he knows so much about our history. If you look straight across our history, as we have discussed earlier, my father is Shona and Zonga. My mother is Zulu. So what am I? I think traditionally, when people looked at families and they looked at who leads the family, why is identity because they're rooted in the paternal side of who we are as people? Now, I think maybe in my language, the reason we say we have ulibo, it's derived from when you put down that first seed 
and now when it grows, the first uh, a joint is called ulibo. Uh, as it grows, grows, it's called imiliba. This is why today, uh, when you are tracing your genealogy, you don't say you are tracing a family tree. That's English. Uyofuna uliba gnaslasa someday. But now, why is it rooted on a male side? Uh, I think it's capabilities. Who approach who first? <laughs> okay. Then you approach a, a woman. And then we'll go and speak to her friends, I'm a uh, then up to Ogogo. And this guy really seems genuine. So who is supposed to take the direction? Mm -hmm. In in the olden days, there's something called Uzwat. So now when we say it means the is a woman now. It means the girl is a woman now. It is a woman now. So young girl, and there's someone who is supposed to take leadership and say, can you come and have this partnership with me? Uzo ngena emzino wa cause. Now, this thing, you see, Akiwagi now, there's a difference between culture, which is e sigo, which is a cultivation of crops, of mind, of everything around you. And then you have something that is called u sigo. Both these things, they can be practiced as a lifestyle. So now, I'm trying to give you a structure of how a culture is, is constructed. It is because of those historical events. Then later, cultures. These cultures can't be practiced, and then you have what you called. This is what we inherited from our forefathers, artifacts, a mahau, a mapesh. We can't wear these things every day because of the time, environment, and the weather conditions. We safeguard these things and say inheritance. But now, this inheritance is used to practice ancient traditions. I, I, I love the fact that you've gone this way. So you've broadened the debate. And then Kale Kona, Dr. Bishop, has got to do with Ukshela. Mm. Because that is where now the paternal side of the identity within a family comes in. Do you go along with that argument and the way he has set up the scene in terms of it leaning towards the paternal side of the identity of the family? So, in the beginning, I was going to say, I was apo kule issue ya identity xa umfana eshela omnye umfana kuyiwa ngapi xa intombi shela omnye intombi kuyiwa ngapi because apho siya khona siya siyo kwakhumzi so kuzo kwakhiwa wa globali apha lo mzi wakhiwa kanjani where is the point of reference yama siko azawusetyenziswa so is that where the the chain then gets broken because i think oh, dr bishop has, has landed on the issue within identity? I, I find it quite problematic to, well, we believe that as Ubaba Shishiluguti is Sigo, it's how things have been done and passed on over generations. For me, I'm of the argument, which is, you also alluded to it, that culture is a social construct. It means we collaborate and make what is known and what works for us. And culture for me, it's not homogeneous, but there's this fixation about the paternal side of things. And my issue is, what happens then? Because Bob Koza speaks of the idealistic African family that is within the construct of a union. Now, Tina, and who are not kids or children, Basem Shadwin, now, we came in. Now, and my maternal side has the full right and access. My father, who did not do what he had to do in Taolo and everything else that he had to do, he didn't do it. So, and I will always give credit and gratitude to them because I am because of them. So, I, I acknowledge my paternal side. But I can tell you, uh, Rob, that at any given consultation in my life, my, my paternal side is always silent. And I always say, thank God that they're silent because they were never effective. They didn't do what is right. 
So I am fairly grounded to believe that. In Kulusek to Anguzu, Lukalmesh Makeba. But I went back and I said, no, there's something wrong with this because Uma Geba have no full authority over me. Even the gift I possess, your more in a Sipasabandabadal, is not from Globawa, it's from Ukog. So for me, I give credit to the paternal side, maternal side, because those are the people that participated fully, and those are the very same people who still bless me. So my view with regards to Bokoza that one, I'm not from an an idealistic family construct. Two, my father was not responsible. So how do I give him credit? How, how do I become Uzu when Nkulusa Gamato Lot Langamand, who have done so much? Now, coming to what um, Ud Doctor is saying about <coughs> us as to how then do we destabilize the norm? Because what Doc is saying is we are troubling the norm by virtue of introducing an alternative way of doing life. Now, until people understand and treat us as queer people, as humans, and remove the title of being fixated on our identity around the sex part, because when you say same-sex couples or same-sex individuals, you are reducing us to the bedroom, whereas there's more to the person, I am Anele, who happens to be gay. But at the essence and core of who am I, I'm a human being. Heterosexual people feel they've got authority to tell us what is wrong. In fact, we are seen as people who delineate and who protest against the normative. We can still have a queer family because it's a different social construct. So if it means mm. It's either often or in the serogas, your ela umund ozang twalilinganian. There are two possibilities about it. Yeah. I can keep it within the family mm. and ask my sister or anyone close to carry the child for me because then it's gonna be complicated. And I'm fully aware of that that is Whose surname is it going child's going to take? Mm. Right? Because mm. if I take an outsider. There are legal processes that there's everything else. But now when it comes into Ubiga Lenga and Samu Sibungaskaban. And again, Umangiti legally, I'm taking this child is mine. You don't have authority over it. What about the rights of passages and, and things that are essential mm. like Uklaula? Ang Tengisbong Klaulinga and Gubang Moshila Laikai. But you didn't do the normal way, but in Moshe. So why should I pay in Klaulu? Right. So, so the, the the break in the chain in terms of what Ubab Koza was saying, we can still we can still culture. continue the chain, yeah. but in a different way. We can still adopt, but the issue of our culture now they will mm. come and impose and say, because this is done this way, it must be kept this way, and that's where I have a problem. So I am of the view that queer identities, because now we've got trans bodies, um, we've got gay bodies. We've got intersex bodies. But all of these people would want to continue to contribute to the ideas of what family is, mm. but it's in the how that's being done. Picking up from what Anneli is saying, the reality is in, in our practice as psychologists, mm. you will walk in and we will start therapy. As we go along, eventually we'll get to a point where whether she is lesbian and identifies as she, mm -hmm. or lesbian and identifies as they, mm -hmm. because you also need to respect the pronoun. You need to respect who the person is. When you introduced me, you said Mrs. Mm. You respected sure. the pronoun. Mm. Yeah. When, I, when I speak to you, I will say he, because that's what you want to be called. So we respect all of those. <coughs> so whether it is she or they who walks into my therapy room and says, I want to have a child. Okay, you want to have a child. Let us now look at your options. Do you, first of all, want to carry the child? Or do you want someone else to carry the child? The families, as Ubab Koza has put it, uh, we are privileged, some of us, to have come from, okay, the family is normal. Normative, normal. Yeah, we've come from mom and dad and they are still together and everything is, you know, rosy. Some of some people are privileged enough to have had that. Other people have had their mother, 
only, and other people have had their father only. When we do, isn't it a sin to? Ma wouti ngi kulele kwa mama, angisi ngi emsamu kwa mama. Ma wouti ngi kulele kababa, ngi emsamu kababa. Depending on which parent left. <coughs> so why are we making it different for the LGBTQI community? You know, as again, I've spoken about composite heteronormativity. Mm. Heterosexual people are careless mm. in their language. There's no sensitivity and empathy, especially people who are traditionalists. And I'm not bashing it about cause, but I understand why our people struggle with language capital of understanding. Even they would say LGBT in Don Don, mm. the LGBTIAQ plus community and that. Well, we've had plenty of social media interaction and uh, one of the first uh, tweets that have popped by, Mr. Hololo, wanting to know how does culture affect gender identity in general? I think it's pretty straightforward. Dr. Bishop, this one's for you. Uh, the challenge is um, uh, the mainstream of doing things. Culture can be sacred. We should safeguard that as well. And women are the people who really um, are entrusted divinely. But uh, in our communities, we really should be recognized. Our word should be recognized. Um, I'll speak for the women because most of the times it's men who go to the crawl, men. But I, I loved what um, uh, Ubayete, uh, uh, his, his Israel Majesty King, Mrs. Zulu Kazweltini, has highlighted the role of uh, U -U -U Queen Mother. Uh, in uh, bringing him, in guiding him, not him only, but guide, guiding the nation at large. So now we can strongly say the balance is coming over there. The illicit outflow of our arms and ammunition, which is our c cultural and uh, traditional uh, practices. Mr. Hololo, thank you so much for that question. I think uh, we'll open it up for you as well to discuss on the various hashtags as we hear on Viceroy Vulu Global. Conversations on culture. Now, the sliding scale of Africanism is where I want to go to. What is it to be African? Who lays claim to this Africanism? Is just you being born on the continent of Africa enough for you to say, this is me and I'm African? I want to bring our two esteemed ladies into this because, hey, I'm a daughter of Wula and Lana Manja. But you can get some Miguelet. Being born in Africa alone, does that just give you the right of passage to lay claim to being African? Why should it not? Does it cut across then the, the various sectors? Because you, you will find, again, descendants from other countries who are here, then they get born, whether white or, or black, mm -hmm. and then they will not say that they're African, but they'll still lean towards the, the European sense mm. of, of, of their culture, mm. so to speak. But being born here, yes, they were born in Africa. Should they be African if they don't embrace it? If you do not embrace it, you may not embrace it, but this is inkabayako mm illa. -hmm. And if inkabayako illa, this is where you come from. You are basically then saying that there's a part of myself that I do not acknowledge and I'm cutting it out. Remember when I introduced myself, I said, I'm a Zulu Tsonga girl. Yeah. I'm also a Shona girl at the end of the day. Zulu because inkabayam ilele, a case it in. Mm -hmm. Tonga and Shona because Ubaba was a limbom. So now if I was to be born la and then leave and go and live wherever I live, whichever continent I decide, it doesn't change the fact that I'm an African. You've embraced it, which is the beautiful thing. Mm. But also nobody forces a culture or cultures into anybody. Yes. But you also find people that tiptoe mm. around the issue of embracing where they were born. Mm. And they always look at Africa, maybe because it's seen as a third world yeah. part of town, that they don't want that association. Yes. There's a lot of reasons around not wanting to be associated with a particular continent. Mm. 
at the end of the day, you can't force anybody to do anything. It is a complete and utter choice yeah. to be or to choose your identity. To choose, okay, the, I identify as an African or I identify as a European human being. It's, your, it's completely at your leisure. How do you do it? But there are reasons that most people don't want to be associated with Africa. Do we address those reasons? Do we talk about them? Do we go into depth about those reasons as to why people don't want to be known as I am an African? Which is sad. Dr. Bishop, let me bring you up because not only are you rooted here, but you also widely traveled. So you get to dip in and find out those that find themselves on the continent, are they identifying themselves? And if they're not, why not? Um, uh, first of all, being African, um, African is the word, the, uh, is the patent ship of uh, this continent that we are in. So when I say I'm an African, I'm driving the reindustrialization. I am driving the, the human spirit uh, uh, that we should really embody, uh, uh, the human spirit that says, I am because you are. You are because I am. Let's stop the wars and create the safe place. We can be able to, to say, to name the world as Africa because the world is what it is today because of the minerals and resources that are coming from this um, uh, continent, uh, the human capital that comes from this uh, uh, continent. Utopics like a seminge, you mean we are the ones who have made it possible for the world markets to trade in gold, in diamonds, and the food our stomachs still in. We are not supposed to have uh, malnutrition. We are not supposed to have imbalances in this continent. Today, I feel good to be an African because I am enlightened of the power that I possess, that I can reclaim back, and actually even the repatriations that my brothers are fighting for, and say, what is it that is in your hand? Do you understand the veil? value, your human value, where you are, so that you can be able to quantify what has been taken from you from the mindset, starting from the mindset, changing the mindset of the world and rebuild that human consciousness that's, that is divine, that is godly. We need to reclaim back, come together as, as one and build that Ark of Covenant. I mean, there's no doubt, just based on that and, and laying the foundation that there's a lot of culture, there's mm. a lot of depth, there's a lot of depth of knowledge. Being African, and we're going to call it the way it is, is at times synonymous with this color, with black people. How do we break this down here in terms of who gets to accept, adopt, and understand what this culture is about in Africa? Being African is laid in local indigenous languages that we have mm. and that, that touch to, to blackness mm. and that touch into how we look and our embodiments. Mm. Two, it has to do with culture, what you spoke about. That there's something that must be inherent about your culture is seen to usigo, amasigo, that make you distinct. Mm. They may not be the same, they may be different, but there must be something that is unique about this culture. Another element of why I think of it is the spirituality of what mm. makes up an African. Outside race, mm -hmm. um, but the kind of race that embodies that, it's, it's black bodies mm. that then have this African spirituality, that then have the language that accommodates them. To be quite honest, our spirituality has been contaminated mm -hmm. um, by the dominant colonial gaze of Christianity that made it look like Christianity is the only dominant way. When we know, or Sister Jessica would know, but because of our constructs of who God was as Africans mm. is located in our languages. How we call Modimo, Umvelingangi, Ukamata, and all of those words that are indicative of our spirituality. And mostly for me, being an African has to do with expressions and these embodiments. And if we talk of whiteness, what expressions are there that speak to that, which who we are? If we speak of an African's community, what are those? Yes, we can talk of Heritage Day, but I consider Heritage Day as an expression that is not tied to a certain kind of spirituality. So what I mean by the spirituality of being an African, we can't talk of Africanism or being African outside African spirituality. Mm. That's my argument. 
I think you throw it nicely, um, Anneli, to where I'm sure Bob Koza will find pleasure in, in picking up. And, and, and I say this because it's, it's the other half of what we didn't cover. So what about the people that find themselves here on the continent, but they're not from here? They're not from here. So how then do they? They're not they, from here. They're not from here, but then they grow families who then root themselves as being from here. Bashangazile Lababan, they migrated in Gabazo, Coco Babozile, then Ababo Nabala. I get come to such a one is back. Simply because all Coco Bo, Coco Baco Bac had benzines, ill, a manduli, lulu. Spiritually, that vibration is shale. This is why to mull out Yebong said, Tegwin, but I'm no Coco Baming Abazab. So it means you. The basic inseparability between those who came before you. What they did in the olden days, they were doing it with you when also Kalwenik born. They gave birth to you. It means Umlung was a Europe, Oza Lelela. Umlung was a Europe, Oza Lelela, a South Africa. Simple as that. Question. Yes, please. We want those questions. Was he not only going to be answering? <coughs> so are we basically saying that a current 20-year-old white male or female Yes is not African. By all means necessary, they are not. They came here in uh, 40, 1419, 1498, about Vasco Those are recorded accounts. And then they gave birth to their kids. 1806, Christians came here. Mm -hmm. After 1652, Jan van Rippie came here. They didn't come here for good reasons. So we've done these things over the years. And then people come and say, we are invading you. We are giving you education. The education that comes with epistemology. The epistemology that is a method of knowing that is according to the West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When are we going to live with our epistemic medicine, knowledge, wisdom that was from our fathers and grandmothers? You are going to say, Umako, what did he write? Empirically, can you quote them? Mm. If we talk about the Africanness, we need to talk about values. Mm -hmm. How our cultures are constructed. Our cultures are not constructed by architecture at the Japan. It is spiritual. This is why Sikoba, Amazangala, Umanga Besaka, Ungen, Ukob, and then Ukulmen, Okokobako, because that's an environment also a killer way. Umlung can't practice that. As Yego in Nindagbona trying to use a democratical nuances, mm. trying to you know, to, to, to fit in in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, modernity. But it was the teachings, though, in the, in the classroom, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the 1652 days, because that is where a lot of things were misconstrued. To say, a human being who arrived in 1652 then discovers the Cape. Yeah, this is Undermining really, mm, the people that were already there. there. And then you say the Africans. But, Hello, but, but is, the people that, that is, were there. That is, that's why I am saying to you, let us get into the space of humanity and unlearn. Uchumakas we must emancipate ourselves from the mental slavery. Yeah. None but ourselves can free our minds. We have been there. But now we are being reduced by, uh, by, by the notions of slave trade, which is, co is continuously doing that now through the education system and the everyday life that is still reducing us. Hence, we are untangling this, going back. Which, where, who are we? And what is it that we can wash away? But we are one. When we are talking about humanity, we are talking about oneness. Mm. I think the one thing I wanted to raise with you, Smobile, is around the usage of terminology. Mm. So for white people, they use immigrants, expats. Yeah. Very kind words. Mm. And then they switch it up when it comes to black people, mm. foreign nationals, you're a foreigner, etc. But also the interesting thing, given your mix as well, married to a Nigerian. So he must be in the crossfire of all of this. How do you read it? It's very difficult to be married to a foreign national yeah. who comes from Africa. Mm. Mm. Because I'm still trying to, to, to understand it better, but there is almost a separation of this is South Africa and then there's you guys. And when you marry a foreign national, so already my father was a foreign national because Shona. Yeah. So my mother 
even now, yeah, she experienced the how mm. That's the word. That's, those are the terms used. Then I come in and I marry a Nigerian, a whole Yoruba man. And then it was quiet for my family because obviously now it's normal. In my family, it's a thing. But in South Africa in general, there's a lot of difficulties you face when you're married to a foreign national that is from Africa versus if I had married a German foreign national. Because we use these terms and we think, oh, no, we're just mm. using them. It's just to explain. Mm. But it's the same as, and I was going to, oh, oh, stop saying them. Stop saying they. Mm. These are, people. Th these people. Mm. Queer. Yeah. They are queer. Mm. It is queer people. So th that's when we need to start a conversation, but not necessarily me, but I'm saying the society. Mm. We need to engage more on this. We are using them, them <laughs> and, and us. And these people. You know, because <laughs> it's him who said us, you know. So there was a segregation already. You, say, you see, when you segregated it, I was like, not okay. Me. In the oh, conversation, yes. Anele, stop segregating. It's politics. <laughs> and I say to you, we mm. must embrace the diversity. Yes. We are one. Mm. We are human. Mm. And each one of us in our spaces, in our communities, let us do as much as we can to form part of the collective and have conversations and build more traditions that will feed into the cultural practices. Uspesile mm. Makinana says that wants to know how does one preserve their culture and heritage in our modern day society uh, where everything is westernized from the food we eat, the language that we speak, mm. or the clothes that we wear. <laughs> so exactly that point. And I agree with you, specifically. So I don't know who wants to take a, a jab at that one. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy. Uh, he's he's ready today. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy. When you look at the embroidery business, once inward, it's not as neat as outward. Yeah. The outward appearance at some point is going to crumble. But the reason the Western uh, organization of our cultures is strong is because the embroidery is as intact inside. Education, mm. church, mm. Um, at work. But what is identity? Identity is not what you produce and then you are appointed. But it is what over the years we have created as cultures, as traditions, until we identify with those things. When we see them, we see ourselves. It's black people who have killed their own cultures. For instance, you want to tell me when you kill an animal, really, 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 you're going to be blessed. Because even in Omo, I can't speak. The soul, everything, even I'm a disease is interwangene in Omo. But it's so essential. Our nana, they can't be identified by Ubungoma. Ubungoma is not culture, it's your gift. Mm. And you don't have to flaunt it on us. It's sacred. You can't, we should not even be seeing it on television. Mm. So that's where the pollution of the Africanness. It is now. This person has, has no problems. But it, hey, I see one, two, I see one, two, three. Because you want a bright pack at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day. It's us black people who are killing our own culture. So is there any hope then of rescuing whatever it is that is left out of this self-destruction? Getting to the final part of our discussion here today, Viceroy Vodum Loma, Conversations on Culture. Is that a preservation? Do we have enough in terms of today's generation to pass it on? In fact, who is in charge of preserving the culture so that it is then passed on, if there's much to pass on? Mom Jessica, Dr. Bishop, from your side, because this is, this is a huge responsibility. So now for those, especially the younger generation watching and saying, what role do we play now in preserving and passing on? 
Our role right now is to um, the, change the curriculum because that's where we, we draw our strength from and we are the educated ones. Um, feed into what speaks to us because we've got the tools to do that. And also get into practice, practicing because uh, most of our, our cultural um, uh, uh, culture and ritual activities are oral. Mm. They need to be done. So practice will preserve our cultural, um, uh, our heritage intelligence. And uh, to keep driving the memory of those who have come before us and maintain our traditional protocols. And we must uh, create apps, uh, 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 virtual apps, uh, so that we can digitize some of the things and play the games. Uh, these things as as handy. Uh, you know, it, it would be very, very interesting even to teach the young ones. I'm teaching a, a two-year-old who says, It's like, That's how when we make, when we tell the stories, the folk and speak our languages because a language is the driver of uh, the pride that we carry within ourselves. And be creative, allow our creative spaces and interact amongst ourselves and open up and not be afraid of each other to have conversations. I see, Louis, let's challenge each other because we are learning from each other. So probably there's, uh, there's barriers that have been identified. Mm. There were solutions, there were solutions, but in between there's barriers. Yeah. The young generation's watching right now and they're saying, hmm, they're enticing us, but how? Mm. You know? <laughs> so that's the how I want to try to get out of you because at least within your practice, you've seen a, a, a cross-section yes. of the community coming to you. Mm. So how do we carry it on to the next generation? Though? So interestingly enough, on our ride here, I was talking to Je uh, Umam Chisik and saying, you know, in my house, my husband says, Ekaro, I say, Sabona and then the children know exactly how to respond to both languages. Mm. And then, Andy, who assists, speaks English. We asked her to speak Isindebele Sagubu, but she's yeah. more comfortable speaking English, so it's fine. Yeah. So they respond to Yoruba, they respond to Zulu, and they respond to English. It's your duty as a parent, as an individual, <coughs> to impart the knowledge to your child. But people are not taking that responsibility. People are leaving it to chance, like, oh, you'll know about it, you'll figure it out. Or we're getting fathers who are basically sitting back and who are not engaged as they used to be in the cultural practices. Mm -hmm. So Ubab Koza might have children and he's not really engaged in the practices at home. So how are his children going to know those practices? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm getting young people, clientele who are, the identity is shaking. It's shaking because I don't know what I'm supposed to do, when I'm supposed to do it, how I'm supposed to do it. And, 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 and I thank you for your honesty because you're utilizing your own personal journey in highlighting where the potential break is. Mm. And that's what leads me to my next question. Um, <laughs> Because it leaves us with serious ramifications. And I'm picking little pockets from everyone's contribution to say that what are the ramifications if the same culture mm. is not taught and it's not passed on? Mm. It's sheer work. In the first place, there's no culture that was supposed to be taught because that was a practice of those people who came before us. Yeah. Mm. The, the, the best thing we need to do is to develop these two eyes, the other eyes, colonial from those who came before us. Oh, what did they do? What were their mistakes? What was wisdom? Yeah. But the other eye is in the present. Mm. But the problem now, as black people, the, the, the reason we have killed our culture, we focus more on the past. Whilst we are focused on the past, we are casting forward future visions based on what our forefathers have done. So there's no evol evolution a space in all of this. F from your side, that preservation, what does it say to you and how can we achieve it? 
I think for me it, it calls to what I I know to be intellectual integrity. Mm. That what uh, Sister Jessica spoke about that if we can do so much work and thanks to place um, to a research institute like National Research Foundation NRF, <coughs> there's a big de um, department that focuses on indigenous knowledge systems, and they fund projects and studies that have to do with cultural preservation. I mean, um, so if, for me, preservation lies in intellectual properties that we have as, as black bodies, mm. that a lot of what we know, um, if so Jessica can write about Amakalon is like saying all of these things, if we can have her work recorded and be prescribed mm. as, an, as a text in literature, in this course, mm. It, to read of Jessica that I know that's accessible, mm. it does something to what because it's it's accessible intellectual knowledges. And ANS two six zero six says, how do people who don't even follow their own culture expect it to be passed on to future generations? I can see you are itching for this one. We mm -hmm. of course. It's 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 straightforward. How can a colonized mind? Mm be left a knowledge that will help it to think differently. There's nothing wrong, because in knowledge, I mean, there's something black people, they are missing about education. They say a taxi driver, if he dies, he can leave a lot of wealth for their kids, but a professor can leave nothing. Who said education is about money? Because it opens your mind around new things that you thought you knew, new yeah. understandings. Yeah. You know, so what I'm saying is, it is very important that we safeguard our, our, our history, heritage, and other traditions, but with the view to teach, not to say you relive those past experiences. It is impossible. And this is why today there are people who are complaining about us using English because they don't know English. It, it, was, it used to be a West German language that later I append with Chabane or Fagi Latin, Greek, so that we can communicate. Yes. Mm. That, that's, that's it. I would say, feeling of cool missing this. I saw the stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, we're going to break away into song any second from now. I think that's just how juicy and enticing these topics have been here today. And the spread of knowledge that we've had here across the table. Anel, I want to thank you so much indeed for coming through. Best of luck with the journey. And I hope to see you again pretty soon. Dr. Bishop, as always, regal and a pleasure. The great knowledge you brought for all of us has been something that we sit in awe and say thank you so much indeed for being a part of this. Is she? Thank you very much indeed. I think what you bring onto the table is very, very valuable. We appreciate it. <laughs> well, let's uh, keep those conversations going. We would love to hear from all of you utilizing all our social media platforms. So get going. Hashtag Volume Long. <laughs>